Hello, my name is Nitya Narsimhan and I'm a senior cloud advocate at Microsoft. Today, I want to talk to you about JavaScript objects. We have a lot to cover, so I actually pre seeded a little bit of code and we're going to walk through this one step at a time. So some of the things you'll learn. How can you represent, what, what exactly are all JavaScript objects? They're ways for you to represent real world objects in code. So how can you do that? We're going to know about, look at that in just a second. Real world objects have associated attributes. In JavaScript, they're known as properties. Real world objects have actions you can execute in them. In JavaScript, those are called methods. And last but not least, we're going to learn about the special keyword called this. So let's start. Since I have a lot to go with, I actually preceded a little bit of code that we can execute one at a time and then we can walk through it. First, we're going to look at how we can define a simple object in JavaScript. So I've uncommented the code and I'm actually going to run it. And you can see that blank type, all I've done is defined blank as open brackets, curly bra braces, closed curly braces. And if I print that out, the type of this is object. So a simple object, any of the simplest object you can think of is effectively a pair of curly braces with nothing in them. In reality though, an object is nothing more than a set of name value pairs that kind of identify the attributes and actions, in other words, the properties and methods of that object. So next, let's actually look at what that really looks like. So I'm gonna comment this out, uncomment the next bit of code and we can walk through this. So now, what we're doing here is really actually providing some properties to this object. Properties are nothing more than name value pairs separated by commas. So let's look at what that looks like when we execute it. Oh, hang on. Need to save that. Now you can see that we have book type still being object, but when I look at the value of it, you can see that it's a series of name value pairs separated by commas. The names are title, author is available. Values, as you can see, can be strings, can be booleans, can be numbers. So at this point, we're beginning to give the object attributes, something that describes the data that you can store in the object. Next, let's look at what we want to do if we want to define actions on the object. So in this case, we're looking at a book, right? What if we want to actually change the status of is available based on whether someone checked in or checked out that book from the library? So in this set of code, Again, let me just run it and then we'll walk through it step by step. You'll see still the same code as before. We have the same attributes, but now we have two additional methods. Methods are nothing more than functions defined or associated with that object. So I want you to pay attention to two things here. First of all, note that functions look just like any other property. They're also a name value pair. They added an, in a comma separated way as well. And they are in fact, just another legitimate property. They're just special properties because rather than have them associated with variables or data, we have them associated with function definitions. In this case, again, just as with regular functions, we'll see this later, you can invoke those actions by calling that particular method. So now we know how to define an object, a very simple object, give it properties and define methods on it. The example you've seen here is called an object literal. And we're going to talk about that in just a second. So it is the simplest way for you to create objects in JavaScript. But what we want to do is we actually want to look at ways in which we can create slightly more, um, or we can look at other ways in which we can create objects as well. So in this particular thing, let's kind of first start by looking at what constructors are. In object literal, which is what you've done before, all you had done is declare the equivalent of a variable, assign to it empty kind of uh, curly braces followed by name value pairs enclosed with it, right? And that created an object. It's literally defining and creating it at the same time. That's how I remember object literals. The other way to create objects is through constructors. And this is an example, a constructor, think of it almost like building up an object bit by bit by constructing things like adding properties, adding methods, etc. And object constructors are templates, they're like blueprints. Again, they define something when you stamp them out using the keyword new, that's when you actually create an instance of the object. So in this case, we are using new object. Object is the base template for all objects. If you have to just define a vanilla object, that's what you would use. 
And now if I define book as a new object and I just print that, I'm going to see, let me actually um, comment this out here. Let's just see what book alone looks like. So in this case, we've defined book as simply a new object, right? No other property, no method. And you can see it's a book is of type object, totally legit object, just like before its value is an empty set of name property values, right? But now if we actually want to start filling data, we can do it in one of two ways. So the first way is you can take those name value pairs that you had had. So in this case, let's just say I stick with two of them, uh, the title and the author, create the equivalent of a container data object container, and then use that as the argument for the new object constructor. So in this case, I've created this data variable and passed it in as the constructor. And now when I actually look at the output, oh, let me just save that. You'll see that book one, this new type is effectively a new object that's been created using those name value pairs I passed in. And now that object is exactly as before. We've got an instance of an object containing those properties. And you know where I'm going next, we've shown you how to like do this with use a constructor with um, properties. You can now use a constructor that also provides in or takes in a data object that has functions defined and your resulting instantiated object now has those functions as well. So till now, what we've learned is you can create an object or rather objects on name are collections of name value pairs. Those name value pairs can represent data in which case they call properties, or they can represent methods that you can run on that object, which are really functions or actions you can take. And you can create those objects in one of two ways as object literals, where you're literally defining and creating it in the same statement or using constructors where you can build them up using this template and then attach more things to it as you go. So that actually we've already covered quite a lot so far. Hopefully that was useful. Next, I want to just talk about properties and methods. And in fact, in that case, let's keep this one open so we can use this data object as our example. So this is great. We now have an object which contains, let's print this out. It contains three attributes or properties, title, author, and is available. And it contains two methods, check in and check out. How do I actually access, and this is great, I have this object, but what, how, how can I actually understand what that contains? So we have two different notations and I'm going to start first by showing you how you use this with the properties. And then remember methods are just special properties. So you can apply the same thing there. And we we'll look at that in just a minute. The way you access it is option number one, use something called dot notation. So in this case, let's comment this out so we can actually access the code here. Okay. In dot notation, what you're going to use is you will effectively take the object name. So in this case, we're looking at object two dot. Now dot is just like, if you're familiar with namespaces, this will probably be very familiar to you. So dot, and then the property name in this case, let's say um, author, right? This should now print out the name of the author. There you go, George Orwell, right? So the dot notation is remember object name dot the property name, and that gets you access to that value. I can also change the value using the same property. I don't want to change it, but we will. Um, let's go and change this to say um, G Orville instead. There, I feel better. I'm not totally lying. Ha -ha. Um, and now let's see if that makes a difference. And you can see that now when I print, let me clear this up so you can actually see it. Uh, and we'll print the whole book. How's that? Because then we can see whether we change the book itself or not. And now you can see that when I set the book two dot author to the new name, the book objects value change. So now the author says G Orwell. So this is how you use dot notation. Brackets notation is exactly similar in terms of what you can do. You can read or you can write data to those properties, but you're going to think of it almost like a hash map where the property name is like the key and your value is represented by using square brackets. So in this case, 
I'm going to just take these three statements and we will replace them here with brackets. So here, rather than use dot, I will use brackets. But remember now these are keys. So I'm going to have to use a string because it's really the key name that I'm being that I'm passing into this structure. So this is using, it's very similar to arrays if you think about it, right? So if you want to remember this, just remember that an object's data value, name value pairs are like a hash map and the names are the keys. So now um, if I want to assign that, I can do the same thing. We'll test both these out in just a second. Okay, so let's look at what happens now. And as you can see, you're seeing the exact same result. So whether I use dot notation or whether I use bracket notation, I get the exact same outcome. Pick whichever path you choose, which one makes most sense to you. I tend to use dot notation a lot more because it's easier to remember. But we can also take this one step further. With this, you were looking at properties. Can I do this for methods? In other words, can I invoke a function? Turns out you can. And the easiest way for me to kind of uh, do this is we'll just replicate one of these. And what I'll do is I will actually print the is available property because we know that there's a method that can change that. And then I will call the method. So let's say this is, was it checked in by default? Yeah, is available is true. So I'm now going to check it out, which should set it to false. And then we can basically see what is the status of is available now, right? Let's just print it. We'll come back and check this later. Okay. So I'm going to close our comment off all of these so we only see the output that we are looking for. So now when I use dot is available, you can see that the property, the property had a value of um, true. And then when I check it out, I'm using the dot notation on the method name to invoke it. And as a result, you can see that now the is available status is set to false because I've effectively invoked that method. Now this is probably familiar to you, but know that you can use brackets notation for methods as well. So I'm going to take the same code. Let's uh, comment. The, okay, let's keep them both. We can then kind of compare and contrast. And in here, what we're going to do is we're going to use the bracket notation. So instead of saying, uh, we'll, we'll use this part the same, but instead of saying book to dot checkout, we are basically going to say square brackets checkout. And now using the key to actually access it. And if we're right, we should get the exact same result. Let's see. There you go. So with that, the last thing we'll talk about today, is the this object. So in all of the code that we've written so far, you might have seen us repeatedly use the term this. So like here in the function, within functions, we have this dot is available. What exactly is this? Think of this as a, a keyword. It's a, it's a, it is a keyword, a reserve keyword. Think of it as a handle to your runtime context within functions. So let's look at what that actually does. So I have two examples here. If we print it out, we can see what this is. So to kind of look at that within this function, I'm just returning this. So it means that whatever was set as the runtime context for the function, I should be able to tell what that was just by looking at the object that's returned. And I'm doing it in two cases. In case one, I have a function defined within an object and that when I call it returns, it's this object. In another case, I have a function that is defined at the global scope, so not within an object, and I return whatever it sees as this. And let's first look at the data and then we'll talk briefly about what this is. So if you look at this, in the first case, which is over here, this is effectively the object that is book itself. So as you can see, when I print out this is, and I call book.object.checkin, whatever it returns, is that object definition itself. In other words, console dot log, in, in other words, this represents the book. An easy way for us to check is to change this now to say, is this actually the book object? And it should be true. 
Hang on, try to clear the screen so we can see it on top top. Okay, so now you can see that when I check to see if the this object returned is the same as the book object itself, that's true. What this tells you is that within the function context of a method, this represents the owner, which is book. However, when your function is defined in the global scope or is not attached to an object, you see that what it returns is this kind of like longish object known as the global object. And the global object is the default object that you can attach things to in the global runtime. A simple way, if you kind of never remember what to call it, they have a dedicated keyword called global this that allows you to reference that object regardless of what runtime you're using, whether it's Node or browser. So in the browser, that global object is typically the window. In Node, it is the standard object called global. So with this, hopefully you understood two things. When you use the term this inside a function, it references the runtime context for that function. If that function exits within an object, then that runtime context for this is really bound to the owner, which is the object itself. If you use it outside of an object, that runtime context is bound to the global scope. So this will return the global object. Hopefully that was useful. I'll see you in the next demo.